From New York City, for our viewers worldwide, I'm Manish Cranny, in for Jonathan Farrow. The question you need to ask yourself as these futures dip ever lower and yields pop higher, as Goldilocks left the building, the countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg, the open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up in today's show, stocks looking to snap. Well, can they? Or will they continue on this losing streak? Jobless claims coming in soft ahead of the payrolls and the Fed minutes signal higher for longer. We begin with a big issue looking ahead to the jobs report. We've got payrolls coming out tomorrow. Payrolls. Payrolls. December payrolls. The first big test to the market of... OK, if that's strong data, then the Fed can stay on hold. I think it's still going to be really solid. Solid, if not strong. Still strong, still solid job growth. Consensus expects about 170,000 jobs. We're looking at 180. This is a super tight life market. There's no urgency to cut rates given a strong economy. The unemployment rate still really pretty low. The market might start to think, well, perhaps it's not actually uh, a situation where, where we will get very aggressive rate cuts. It's probably a bit too early to be signaling or at least validating the, the market expectations of rate cuts as early as March. We really need to see some evidence of deceleration in the data. There's a lot of uncertainty. Could be positive or negative. There has to be some sort of data reality check for the market. The key here is uh, job creation. The jobs market will play an important role this year. Joining us now to break it down in Castle Forward Black Rocks, Amanda Lynham and MUFG's George Gonzalez. Okay, here we go. We've got the ADP report that came out, 164,000 jobs. Doesn't look as if we're wilting at the moment and pay rises are plenty. George uh, and Amanda, good morning. Let's take it to you. We're looking at one of the worst market setups since 1999. Are you shaken or unperturbed? George, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, look, I think uh, we have to also realize the starting points matter, too. Like last year, we finished on a really strong and high note. So the yeah, market's giving back those gains that were really fueled by lower rates. And now the market's questioning that. I think it's it's fair game to see the sort of kind of uh, repricing in the first week of uh, January. And Amanda, to you, I mean, I started the show by saying uh, there's a risk that, of course, Goldilocks might have uh, fled the building. I mean, there's this anti-Goldilocks narrative that is evolving. In other words, that syncopated rise in equities, rise in bond prices and drop in yields may well be breaking down. Good morning, Manis. Thank you for having me. I, I think I loved what you had in the intro about the reality check. I think what this is is a course correction from perhaps some over exuberance um, in the last part of 2023. And in, in my market of, of corporate credit, spreads tighten significantly to levels that were likely unsustainable. And so I think this is probably a healthy correction. We're seeing weakness, but I would say we're not seeing a lot of activity in terms of trading yet in our market. Very very focused on new issue activity. Uh, so we'll see how that plays through. I think as it relates to the data for the rest of the week, specifically non-farm payrolls tomorrow, I think really what the data this morning is highlighting is that there are upside risks still to the economy. And so the market is probably right in recalibrating calibrating expectations for significant swift rate cuts in the early part of, of 2024. And I, and I think that that's appropriate. So, Amanda, you would say that a lot of, a lot of the, the tightening in spreads was pulled forward into that back quarter. I mean, that happened a lot in the bond market, 100 basis points uh, of a drop in yield. FCON became lush. It's a bit like me and Annabelle's in West London on a Friday night. But a lot of that squeeze was pulled forward. So what happens to credit in this first? What changes the narrative for credit in this first quarter? I think really for 2024, the narrative for credit is all about the cost of capital and refinancing activity. And I think the positive data point that we've seen is that um, the the willingness of the Fed in particular to embrace a path that they will be normalizing policy in response to declining inflation um, has been positive for risk sentiment. There's a lot of focus right now on the timing of rate cuts. But what we've emphasized is that the reason for those rate cuts really matters. And so so 
if we're getting rate cuts because of a downturn in growth, that's much less supportive for risk assets. But if we're getting rate cuts, eventually our base case is the second half of next uh, of 2024 this year. Um, if we're getting rate cuts because inflation is 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 retreating, then that's a much more supportive outcome for risk assets. So I, I think we actually can have a pretty supportive setup for credit risk, especially for yield-based buyers, because although yields have retreated, they're still pretty attractive from historical standards, specifically in the post-financial crisis era. Um, so I think if I'm an investor, I'm bracing mm -hmm. for more supply relative to last year, um, probably a bit wider spreads, but nothing dramatic, um, a bit more in default and loss activity, but still pretty contained. And and looking for uh, selective ways to deploy risk. Okay, I, that's a fairly robust setup. George, let me take it back to you on the equity side, because if we're cutting rates because inflation is well behaved, it's hurrah for risk. If we're cutting rates because we don't get the growth that we expect and perhaps the not the soft landing, then that is more negative for equities. So cast forward for me, we've got a bit of a wobble in these first couple of days, but could that spiral into a bear market? Look, I think, look, this, this quarter is going to be super critical. Can rates rise for the right reasons? I mean, we have had a massive rally in rates. Spreads have also tightened as the management going through, which is, I, I agree. But like, we, we moved from like a, a yield kind of chasing story, and I think the spreads are going to play a critical role even for equities as well. So if spreads start widening in credit, it's because we're worried about growth and just the kind of credit conditions more broadly, which leads us up into the end of the quarter and the bank term funding program and what will the Fed do with that. So I think you know, the Fed obviously has changed, has pivoted both now on rate policy as well as on the balance sheet policy, as we heard yesterday in the minutes. So something has gotten to the Fed, and, and it could be that they're trying to soft land us and they're trying to kind of foam the runway of I've been calling it for quite some time. You know, we've had a March call <laughs> really ahead of most people. And I think if they cut then, you know, it could be because they're trying to soft land us. But it could be because we're actually seeing credit conditions worsen and we have this bank term funding program that's still unresolved. Yeah, well, we've yet to even have any real turbulence before we roll out the foam, uh, George. So just hold that thought. Uh, let's uh, push it forward on the data front because jobless claims set the stage for payrolls. Tomorrow, Bloomberg's Mike McKee is with me now. We've had the ADP numbers. Mike, uh, what else uh, are you looking at specifically ahead of uh, the jobs report tomorrow? <laughs> Well, all the data is in that would be a, what you use in a model to try to come up with a number for tomorrow. So we'll watch what the overall number is. It's gone up a little bit to 172,000 from 171 after today's numbers. 164,000, as you mentioned, on ADP. Now, the scary thing about that is ADP over much of the last six months has come in below where non-farm payrolls private hiring has come in. Jobless claims were weak, 202,000, but it is a holiday week, so uh, it's kind of hard to say that's an accurate number. So let's go back to the survey week, the week that includes the 12th, and it was just as low, pretty much. So doesn't suggest that we're going to see a lower number. Manufacturing jobs while still contracting at a slower pace, and the conference board's jobs plentiful index rose during the month. So all signs point to a relatively strong number. Now, uh, what does that mean? <laughs> Is the labor market running too fast for the Fed? Whoa, Nelly, they might say. <laughs> Slow down a little bit. You look at the uh, number of average number of jobs created in 2019 versus 2023, and we're well ahead of that pace. And the same thing holds true for unemployment and for earnings. Unemployment is lower averaged at least in uh, 2023 than 2019 before the pandemic and average hourly earnings as we know have been running stronger where does that leave us well we're expecting a strong report tomorrow a relatively strong report but economists do see a change coming the latest survey of economists by bloomberg suggests that 2023 average hiring number is going to come way way down unemployment is going to rise significantly and average hourly earnings are going to fall off does that happen or do the numbers we're likely to get tomorrow call that into question that's what the fed's going to be debating as the year goes on Indeed, and the strength of those numbers tomorrow will set the table in terms of March rate cuts and the rest of the year. Mike McKee, thank you very much. Amanda Lynham, let's me bring it to you. It's not that the six rate cuts are off the table by the market at the moment, but there has been a dissipation of conviction for March. My question to you is this. Do I push later in the second half of the year for these cuts? And this data still holds, our data holds up for the first couple of months here and it just pushes that narrative into the back half of the year. So it's not that we don't get six, it's just later. 
Right. I think it really hinges on the labor market, Manus. If we're still seeing these upside pressures to average hourly earnings, the employment cost index, if we have an unemployment rate that still remains below 4 percent for nearly two years running now, uh, I think it I think it reduces the urgency of the Fed to normalize policy rates. Our base case is the second half of this year, but we've acknowledged after the December FOMC that the risks to that are clearly skewed earlier. Um, so that that's our working assumption at the moment. I, I do think, though, even if we if we take the labor market data from this morning in isolation, uh, maybe the early signaling points to a positive report. But I would also point to just CEO confidence and strategic M&A activity that has been rebounding over the past few months. That, I think, is also an indicator of what could be going on in the labor market. And so if we are seeing CEO confidence improve, if you're seeing strategic M&A, which we have been increased back to levels that we last saw in 2020 and 2021 after that wave of, of COVID-related M&A, uh, that I think is also supportive for probably a, a resilient employment picture. And so that's something that we're watching very closely in addition to the typical employment metrics. George, let's just r round off the thought process with you. I was just looking at, at, at Mike's projections, and he's talking about 4.2% uh, in terms of the unemployment level. He's talking uh, about job creation dropping quite significantly this year, 74,000, 4.2% in the unemployment rate, uh, and, and wages uh, dropping quite significantly. Does that stack up for a soft landing, in your view? And it, you know, what does that do to risk? Look, those numbers are averages, right? And we got to be careful with the averages in general, because last year, the second half of the year, most jobs were created by the government and the healthcare sector, and private enterprise were not really hiring. So we have a labor hoarding, almost like a labor freeze on the private sector side. So I better hope those CEOs are as confident as they're suggesting and start hiring people, because it's not coming from the private side, it's coming from the government side. So if you take that and then you look at those averages that Mike put up on the board, those are recessionary type numbers, 4.2% unemployment rate from, a, from, a, from a, a low level that we got last year and only in under 100,000 on AFP. Those are like those are mild recession numbers. OK, uh, team, stay with us. Amanda Lynham uh, mm -hmm. and George Goncalves, uh, my guest this morning on the markets. Let's look at what's under the hood uh, and what will move us at the opening bell. Abigail Doolittle is with me. Abby. Well, man, as we're looking at a potential fourth down day for Apple in a row right now, uh, heading into today, headed toward a 5% loss in the first three trading days of 2024. This is Piper Sandler uh, is downgrading shares of Apple, uh, adding to the downgrade that we saw earlier this week, a bit of a bearish move here, uh, joining that Barclays downgrade. And they are concerned also about iPhone inventories uh, and demand. So that stock, again, dragging on the futures and down for a potential fourth down day in a row. Walgreens uh, Boots Alliance, it had been higher earlier and they actually put up a decent quarter where their loss beat estimates. The Revenues beat estimates, so we'll be digging into what's dragging on that stock at this point. And then Dick's Sporting Goods, we actually have an upgrade in terms of a price target being raised, but it's interesting, Manus, we did, of course, have breaking news moments ago that Wilson Tennis Racket maker Amer Sports has filed for an IPO. Maybe that will help out Dick's in the future. <laughs> uh, yeah, everybody's uh, looking for the next IPO. Abby, thank you very much. Abby, will do a little on what's under the hood. We'll see how these cash markets open in just a few moments. Coming up on the show, let's get intentions in the Middle East. We don't want to see it widen beyond Israel and Hamas. And again, we're going to keep working with partners in the region to prevent that from happening. Oil edging higher for a second day on these Middle East tensions and turmoil. Libyan supply disruptions. That conversation next on Bloomberg. force posture changes that the president has ordered in the region has been designed to prevent an escalation or widening or deepening of this conflict. Um, as we've said before, we don't want to see it widen beyond Israel and Hamas. And again, we're going to keep working with partners in the region to prevent that from happening. Middle East tensions are escalating. Two members of the Iran-backed militia are dead. It's after an explosion at a Baghdad security site. This comes after blasts targeted a crowd marking the death of a top Iranian general killed in 2020. And the U.S. and its allies continue to issue warnings against Houthi rebels, as the Houthi militants, I should say, as the group uh, claim another Red Sea vessel assault. Oil ticks higher this morning. Uh, the fears are mounting of a wider conflict could 
impact supply. Team coverage, Kayleigh Lenz in Washington, D.C., Julian Lee in London. Kayleigh, let me bring it to you first of all. The, the, there's a slow and steady rise in geopolitical tension from uh, attacks inside Iran to more military action in Iraq. Just take us through the choreography of the first three days of the new year. Well, it's been something each and every day, Manus. Today, of course, these drone attacks in Iraq that have killed at least two commanders of an Iranian-backed militia. Iraq is blaming U.S.-led forces for that attack. And it follows just yesterday those blasts in Iran, which Iran called a terror attack, though did not directly assign blame to any one group. And no group immediately has taken uh, credit for it. We will have heard from the U.S. that there is no indication that Israel was involved in any way. And Middle East experts I've spoken with over the last 24 hours say all signs point to this being a separate terrorist organization trying to take advantage of what is a very unstable time in the Middle East, because that really is what is so concerning about this, the idea that this is going to escalate into a broader regional conflict, because those the attack in Iraq today, the blast in Iran yesterday, follow earlier this week, Israel striking a Hamas target, a very high-level uh, member of, of the Hamas organization, on Lebanese soil in Beirut. Just a day before that, Iran sent a warship to the Red Sea, where we know it puts it much closer to actual U.S. naval forces in the region, that together with this other maritime task force that has been assembled, they are trying to deter and defend against Houthi attacks. Now, it's clear that the Red Sea is still disruptive in terms of actual flow of trade. So there is an ongoing conversation about potentially going on offense, directly striking the Houthis, which, of course, are another Iranian proxy where they are in Yemen. But again, this feeds into concern about potential escalation, because at the end of the day, the U.S. really is trying their best to avoid this conflict widening between Israel and Hamas. And, and that task force, Kaylee, Julian, Lee, let's bring you into the conversation. That task force is gathering in terms of not just physical presence, but warnings. The U.S. and their partners are warning the Houthis against further attacks. They call the situation unacceptable, profoundly destabilizing, and they will hold malign actors accountable. In terms of risk ratcheting, a colding malign actors accountable. That smells and sounds like something that we could trip ourselves over into something much more significant on a geopolitical front. Yes, I think it, it does. I mean, I think they've been very careful to uh, try to limit this very specifically to um, what's going on in the Southern Red Sea. Um, and I think these warnings are uh, directed very, uh, very precisely at uh, the Houthis in Yemen, um, and I think it suggests that um, action may go beyond just trying to uh, shoot down drones and missiles uh, that are, are targeting um, uh, traffic in, in the area. I, I don't see this as a, a, as a sort of a threat to uh, Iran directly. I don't think Iran wants a, a, a fight with the U.S., and I don't think the U.S. wants a fight with Iran. Um, but I think it is a, uh, a, a definite warning uh, to those who are seeking to impede the flow of uh, ships through the Southern Red Sea. Yeah, I, the, the risk is accidents, not deliberate, uh, not deliberate moves by the coalition. Kayleigh, thank you very much. Julian Lee, uh, our Bloomberg Opinion columnist. We'll hear more from Kayleigh uh, a little bit later on. Amanda Lynham is my guest, along with, John, uh, along with George uh, Gongalvez. Uh, OK, Amanda, I want to bring it to you. I mean, both of you will say to me, oh, we don't trade geopolitics. We just sit back, we watch, we observe. I mean, that, that, that is an impossible position for risk. Do you, are you having more deeply concerned conversations about geopolitics and how it might impact risk and oil prices? Last year was $100 oil, but how are you thinking about risks right now geopolitically? Absolutely. I think um, we've, had, we've had these ebbs and flows of geopolitical risks over the past several years, whether it was U.S.-China trade tensions, the Russia-Ukraine war, now the conflict in the Middle East, and um, the various nuances to that. I think it, it really has two main implications for asset allocation. One is just the potential to uh, negatively influence risk sentiment, which we always have to be watching on guard for that. I think the second point is really feeding into this point of dispersion that has been with us for most of 
2023, actually. And it really points to um, companies that have built resilience into their supply chains, uh, their cost input programs, the ability to source raw materials. Are they a commodity producer or a commodity purchaser? Are they dependent upon significant freight logistics costs to get their products where they need to go? All of those will factor in and become more relevant. There are periods of time where those ideas and, and those nuances matter less, and there are times like today where they matter much more. And so that will be relevant. Now, there are certain sectors mm -hmm. that are more exposed to that, which um, you know we, we are paying a lot of attention to. I think one of the sectors that's positively positioned in that is actually financials, um, not dependent on making a widget and shipping it across international waters, things like that. And so I think that on, on net, it actually supports the case for financials from a sector allocation perspective. The last point I would make, Manus, is that it just further emboldens the case for onshoring, nearshoring, friendshoring, which is a longer term structural trend that we're also watching. Yep, and that's only going to play out, I would imagine, in the political conversations between now and when we get to the election. George, let me bring it to you. What is defensive for you? I'm drawn to your call on short-term IG, short-term bills. That's slightly more a rates call, but in terms of a defensive, a slightly more defensive positioning to geopolitics, or do you just go, Manus, I don't trade politics? No, no, look, we, in macro, we're obviously uh, highly influenced by the geopolitical uh, backdrop. So if this were to escalate further, um, it does uh, throw a monkey wrench into like what is the right move out of the Fed. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, cutting rates and, and providing financial easing uh, would probably add to the inflation fire if oil were to move higher there, but also would be supportive of the banks. So I, I generally agree with that view that Amanda has as well, that banks should do well this year. The, the Fed wants to ultimately steepen the curve. So the, the idea is whatever gets them to steepen the curve faster, that's going to be good for, you know, for leverage plays and for interest rate sensitive sectors. Uh, but in general, though, if, if this were to get worse, what we really have to watch is inflation break-evens. Inflation break-evens last year barely moved. I mean, we've had, we had all this concern about inflation. The Fed was hiking rates, finished the hiking cycle, yep. and inflation really wasn't concerned. We had very low volatile inflation uh, expectations. If that were to pick up, that would also get the Fed nervous. We'll keep an eye on those break-evens, on the five-year break-evens. Thank you, team. Uh, George Gonzalez and Amanda Lynham on the markets. Coming up, your morning calls. Of course, Julian Lee, Emmanuel mm. Mac expecting stocks to go nowhere in 2024. That conversation still ahead right here on Bloomberg. Get your morning calls in and a look at what the analysts are saying. First up, Barclays upgrading Home Depot to overweight, expecting stronger demand and higher home prices. Next up, JP Morgan upgrading American Express to overweight, recommending a more defensive stance within the consumer finance sector. And finally, Apple having a brutal time of it, receiving its second downgrade in as many days. Piper cutting the shares to neutral and growing iPhone inventory concerns. Coming up, I get the name right this time. Ever course, Julian Emmanuel joins me. Uh, a lost year for equities. I hope not. The conversation on Bloomberg. We're counting down to the open. Are you nervous? Bond yields are rising. These equity markets are nervous uh, that we're going to have a reverse Goldilocks scenario. There is the uh, opening bell. We're going to roll it over and have a look at the cash prices. Of course, semiconductors uh, were under pressure yesterday. If Apple has had its double downgrade. That is dragging the Nasdaq lower, and this is the state of play on the futures. There is the opening bell. As I say, keep an eye uh, on Apple and some of the big chip makers, which, of course, were the bail weathers of 2023. We're rolling down here. This is a reverse Goldilocks scenario. The Russell ticks up ever so slightly. Uh, across the rest of the assets, this is what we've got for you. The euro dollar uh, at 109.43, ticking higher ever so slightly. There's a big old note out from Morgan Stanley this morning. They're dropping their contrarian bet on the dollar to rally in 20. 24. The dollar's down for the fourth day in a row, and the euro is bid a little bit higher. Ten-year yields, it really wants to kiss 4%, and if it does that, what does that do to that tech bet? Crude is up by uh, a quarter of 1% as we see geopolitics uh, really rising around the Middle East in terms of uh, supply outages uh, in Libya, along with uh, more angst in the Red Sea. 
There's only one stock to watch. It is, of course, Apple. Well, of course, there, there are a few others. But we're down for the fourth day in a row. Another analyst dying, Gray. This time it is from Piper Sandler. Ed Ludlow is with us from San Francisco. Now, this comes down to inventory. But, of course, we've had the evangelist Dan Ives on to rebut this. Ed, good morning. First of all, what are the details on the dying grid? Yeah, I think Piper Sandler, uh, in sort of solidarity with Barclays, that was the leader on, on downgrading earlier this week, look at the, the data on how the iPhone 15 is doing, both in terms of volume and mix, and they have big concerns about the growth trajectory, right? The, the run of four quarters of decelerating sales growth over 2020. Three calendar 23 was a big concern to the market, and Piper Sandler, in downgrading to neutral, uh, are basically saying we think that that trend will continue into uh, calendar 24. This is a firm that's held a pretty bullish view on Apple going back to the early days of, of the pandemic in March of, of 2020. In the four-day period, we're down a percentage point for that four straight day of declines on Apple. It's more than $170 billion of market cap shed. And we go back to what we discussed 24 hours ago. Yes, a 50% gain in 2023 for Apple, but of the Magnificent Seven, it was the sort of most lackluster of the big tech. It also has the sort of least uh, bullish uh, consensus. If you go on ANR on your Bloomberg terminal, of all the big tech stocks, the fewest buy ratings. Another really important stock that we're watching this morning, Manus, as well, is Mobileye. It's on track for its biggest decline on record. Why? It gave us a prelim look of its full year 24 sales outlook. Revenue of $1.83 billion to $1.96 billion for this year. But the street was looking for $2.58 billion. The story here really simple. Mobileye makes chips or systems on a chip that power the sensor suites for advanced driver assistance in cars. And what they're saying is that after the chip crunch of 2020, all of those tier one suppliers that were worried about chip shortages for ADAS bought up inventory. Those inventories are too big, and so now they've stopped buying, and they need to work through the inventories, which Mobileye says will happen in the first quarter of this year. The other thing that's happened is that the automakers have cut their production targets for this year as well, which has a downstream effect on the number of cars that need advanced driver assistance solutions. That stock down 27%, but look at many other chip makers that supply the automotive sector. They're also lower on this idea that either there is a glut in automotive chips that needs to be worked through, or at the downstream side, production of these automakers is definitely going to hit some of those key suppliers. It's amazing how we, how we vault from you know, famine to feast, Ed. And then, of course, there is all about the acceleration in terms of the electric vehicle uh, production. And that looks shaken in the traditionals, uh, but powering ahead of the likes of Tesla. Cathy Wood buying Tesla again today. OK, uh, Ed, good to see you. Let's get into some of the earnings. We've got the food sector. We've got Cal Main shares under pressure after a drastic decline in egg prices weighed on a quarterly basis. Abigail Doolittle is with me. I'm a big buyer of eggs. Good morning, Abby. Well, apparently your big buying uh, <laughs> didn't help them out, and not because you weren't buying the volume they needed, but because, to your point, prices on eggs are down, a, an example of real-world inflation declining. Relative to the stock, it's interesting because in the pre-market, it had been down as much as uh, 5%, more than 5%, heading to a fourth down day in a row, but now it's up slightly, probably because of the decline into today, right around 7%. So some of this may be priced in. Relative to that adjusted earnings miss, they missed by 57 percent. They put up 35 cents, and that's also a 91 percent year-over-year decline. So some real weakness there. But it seems as though with the stock up uh, a bit, now up quite a bit, up 1.75 percent, that investors are relieved that it wasn't worse than perhaps what they had expecting. They also mentioned that they lost about 3 percent of their flock. As for Conagra, the packaged food company, uh, that stock is down 1.2 percent. They put up a mixed quarter. They beat adjusted earnings by 4 percent. They missed sales by 1 percent. But the big deal, Manus, is the fact that they they cut their outlook. They now expect organic growth of 1% to 2%. And this is interesting because they're saying that consumers are cutting back on packaged, uh, packaged food buying. And it's not limited to cash-strapped consumers. It's also high earners. So it looks like there's some frugality there as uh, at the end of last year, perhaps into this year. And as a result, they now expect volumes to be down. That stock over the last year down about 24%. Abby, do you know what you've managed to make me find on the Bloomberg terminal? What? The price of Class A. A dozen eggs, class A dozen eggs, down by 50% in terms of price. That's what you've provoked me to now. There we go. Price of eggs. You can get everything on your Bloomberg terminal. Let's stick with the earnings. Uh, we've got Walgreens slashing its dividend nearly in half, despite topping its quarterly profit estimates. Why? Simone Foxman, tell me more. 
Yeah, and talk about wild swings here in Walgreens. We've seen shares up as much as 4.7% in pre-market, now trading down over 9.5% in the first few minutes of trading. That dividend that you mentioned, uh, that was actually seen as something that's positive by analysts, including Raymond James. Uh, Cowan saying that it removes the overhang and provides the company with more strategic options. So that was on the good side. Also on the good side was earnings per share that came in ahead of expectations as well as sales and the company able to in fact maintain its full year fiscal outlook something not every analyst believe it could do however we started seeing uh, pre-market shares really start falling uh, pretty substantially as the earnings call went on and part of the reason may have been that the company looking at retail comparable sales for the fiscal year expecting now that they will decline in the low single digits previously expected they would be flat also talking about a more challenging environment versus the previous outlook. Analysts are very much hoping that uh, the, co the company will shift more into healthcare related stuff, but the CEO also said he doesn't see more primary care investments. Uh, one wild card here could be the potential sale uh, of, in the future uh, of the Boots chain, the international part of its business for as much as $8.8 .8 billion. But at least at the moment, analysts really not liking what they see. And this after a 30% decline in Walgreens shares last year, Manus. That is a brutal price drop at 9.4%. Simone, thank you very much. Uh, finally, let's turn to the home builders. Where are we going to go in 2024? We have a New Year hangover. UBS downgrading the shares of Pult Group to neutral. Katie Greifel is alongside me. So this is a, a bit of a punch to one of the home builders. Good morning, Katie. A little bit. But Manus, this is really a case of being a victim of your own success. You take a look at Pulte Group. Remember, it rallied almost 127% last year alone. You compare that to the Broad Home Builders Index up uh, just a pedestrian 81%. And that's a big reason behind UBS's downgrade to neutral. The firm is still positive on home builders in general, but when it comes to Pulte Group, margins and returns should normalize more than its peers, a process that'll take us through 2026. And that normalization process, it's expected to limit Pulte Group's upside to its current valuation. It's important to note, though, here that while downgrading Pulte Group, UBS actually lifted its price target to $120 from $93. And for context, you take a look at shares right now, currently trading around $100 or so. And uh, it's actually up a little bit higher, so defying this downgrade overall, Manus. Okay, Katie, thank you very much. Uh, Katie Greifel there on the builders and the outlook. And of course, Julian Emmanuel, looking ahead, for 2024 says this anticipating a recession and volatility is like watching paint dry forward indicators suggest recession is near yet yeah, recession canaries along with the credit spreads and the vix say not quite yet julian good to see you a very good morning to you so it's a recession delayed not denied given the adp numbers we're running into the jobs report tomorrow just and we've got lush fcon so how firm a footing are we in in the first half? How, how, how short term or medium term are you looking at? So we expect a recession at, at mid-year. And, and again, the part of uh, what, what has been, you know, frankly, a happy circumstance and a bit of a mystery is that the labor market has stayed as resolutely strong as it has. And the data, again, confirmed that uh, today. But when we think about uh, the equity markets in general, um, the, the issue facing stocks in the first half of the year is that the optimism accumulated over these last few months and obviously the consequent rally uh, that accompanied that optimism really make the market uh, much more prone uh, to reacting uh, to news that's anything less than perfect. And of course, again, part of the narrative of, of this week is that stocks have sold off in response to the fact that yields seem to have found the floor given this economic news. Do you think we're entering into a form of anti-Goldilocks, reverse Goldilocks? Because if you think of the last two months of 24, it was a syncopation, wasn't it, between bonds and equities. Here we are. Uh, we're trying to get to 4% again. We're trying to sort of readjust our, recalibrate our bond rate to 4%. And in that recalibration, it, it's provoking in some way, a response mechanism from the equity market. So do you believe in reverse Goldilocks? 
I, I don't think it's necessarily a reverse Goldilocks. More over the fact that that you know, again, given the rally since the lows in October, and given the the you know surge in sentiment, uh, surge in call volumes, and and this general expectation uh, of Goldilocks, what what you are is more susceptible to gyrations. Yeah. It, yields more than anything else. And at the end of the day, you really traded in and around 4% on the 10-year yield for the last number of weeks. And that's filtering into noise in, in the stock market. If we're to reappraise the the pricing, the pricing in the bond market is for six rate cuts. That, that, that's that been tempered, I think, from the FOMC minutes. I, I, to a certain extent, we all got over our skis in understanding what Powell meant on December 12th and 13th in regards to uh, the pivot. Um, so here we are, we're trying to recalibrate. You say it's going to start wild and promises to get wilder. My question is, are we going to get a wilder reappraisal in the equity market than we are in the bond market? I mean, who is the tail? Who's the tail on the dog here? Is it equities or the bonds? So if you look at the last two years, uh, the tail has been the bond market wagging the dog of the equity markets and to a lesser extent the credit markets. Uh, all the volatility has been in the bond market. It's our expectation uh, that after sort of a historic relationship where bond volatility has been extreme uh, and equity and credit market volatility have been uh, much more muted, that you're going to have a convergence to that. And, and again, when you think about it with this, uh, particularly this backdrop of an earnings season that's mm -hmm. going to start next week, where expectations for full year 2024 are high, even in a no lending scenario, it's reasonable to expect more equity market volatility. Sort of part of me secretly delighted that you say we're going to retest the 200-day moving average because I'm in that, that, that no man's land of transferring my life from one country to another and I'm uninvested in my pension. You say we're going to test 39.70 before uh, we, we, we move higher again. What is it that gets me back to 39.70? Cash trades at 4,700 at the moment. So that's not an insignificant uh, retracement. So, so there's two ways of, of thinking about this. First off, 2023 was a very rare year in that volatility, as we all know, was extremely subdued. The market, with the you know the brief exception of the July to October downdraft, essentially traded straight up, and of course like for a few weeks in March, the typical year without a recession sees a pullback of 13 percent. That alone, if you didn't have any economic uh, uh, softening would get you to the neighborhood of 4170. It's our view that at some point towards mid-year, the market will have to do a little bit more discounting, not only the potential uh, for the softening in the economy, but also the potential that given geopolitics, uh, that, uh, um, that uh, inflation is perhaps uh, not as quick to fall as the expectation for rate cuts priced in as well. And, and the confluence of all that, plus this extreme confidence as we enter 2024, likely causes the sentiment shift that gets you towards those figures. Okay, well, there's a few more uh, banana skins out there for us in the markets, and we'll talk about those in just a moment. Uh, Evercore ISI's Julian Emmanuel uh, sticks with us. Coming up, markets brace for, you got it, presidential election. We could see Trump as the presumptive nominee by Super Tuesday, which is March 5th. It's entirely possible this will be over in two months. That conversation next on Bloomberg. Just fighting for second place, uh, John. I, I don't see uh, this. Maybe a chance in New Hampshire that Trump could slip below 50 percent. Trump will do very well in Iowa. We could see Trump as the presumptive nominee by Super Tuesday, which is March 5th. It's entirely possible this will be over in two months. Will it really be over in two months? Presidential hopefuls gearing up for pre caucus spotlight. GOP contenders Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis set to grapple in a series of back-to-back -back Iowa town halls. Meanwhile, the Republican frontrunner, Donald Trump, urging the Supreme Court to keep his name on the Colorado ballot. And President Biden proposed for twin events designed to take his aim 
at the opponents across the aisle amid a worsening polling set of numbers for him. Kayleigh Lyons is in D.C. soon to pack her bag and go on the road for weeks at a time. Kayleigh, good to see you this morning. Where should we start uh, in terms of Iowa? How important is it for these two contenders to have a good showing in these kind of debates? Will, will it help define where they are? Well, Iowa really is going to be, man, as for Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, whether a question of whether they can put up a strong enough showing in second place, because Donald Trump, it is highly likely, is going to win Iowa. He is leading in the polls there by a wide margin, just as he is leading in most national polls by some 50 points. If they can put a strong enough showing in Iowa, either Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis, the theory is that maybe they could ride that momentum into New Hampshire. Nikki Haley is only behind Trump by 14 points in the Granite State in the latest St. Anselm poll. So it does make these town halls incredibly important. All three of them will be appearing in Fox News town halls next week. And then on Wednesday the 10th, it will be Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis only on CNN. This, of course, comes against a backdrop of Trump's myriad legal challenges, including the question of whether or not he can even be on the ballot in states like Colorado and Maine. Trump and his legal team, of course, asked the Supreme Court yesterday to take up the caller ruled, ruling that barred him from the ballot on the grounds of the 14th Amendment, which essentially says no one can hold public office that engaged in insurrection. Trump saying he did not engage in insurrection and also that the 14th Amendment doesn't actually apply to the presidency. So that will be the legal question before this highly conservative U.S. Supreme Court, three justices of which were appointed by the former president. And just finally, this also speaks to how Biden is trying to cast this 2024 race, essentially the idea that Trump is a threat to American democracy. Democracy. That is the message he will be taking to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania tomorrow. Of course, in a swing state, also a historically important uh, location in terms of the American Revolution to talk about this democratic threat. He also was going to head later Monday, uh, later on on Monday to South Carolina at the historic Black Church in Charleston where nine churchgoers were killed by a white supremacist in a mass shooting back in 2015. South Carolina man is, of course, significant, not just because it's the home state of Nikki Haley, where she served as governor, but also because Biden is really struggling to retain the black vote at this point. Yeah, a, a lot of struggles for Biden. I mean, what is it in the swing states? We've got our last poll that we did, 58 percent of the voters in those swing states uh, hold an unfavorable view of Biden, but 53 percent hold an unfavorable view on Trump. So these first sort of couple of weeks are going to define perhaps the zeitgeist as we go forward. Kaylee, uh, it's my first time in America for a full election cycle. I'm excited for that. <laughs> Kaylee Lines uh, there in D.C. Of course, Julian Emanuel is our guest this morning, weighing in on markets during election politics. And this is what he says. The narrative has shifted from presidential election years, which are generally good for stocks, to, oh, well, January, February of election years tend to be weak. 2024 has started wild and it promises to get wilder. So, Julian, good morning. On the political front, you say that we need to understand they who control Congress will control, obviously, a great deal of the political narrative. What are we underestimating right now at the start of what's going to be, I think, a pretty exciting uh, election year? Well, what we're underestimating is, first off, this is a year where macro, as has been the case very much the last couple of years, is likely to drive the narrative. And when you think about it in the context of politics, what we did was we looked at years, election years, where the balance of power in the Congress is as finely balanced as it is now. Uh, Ten or fewer seats in the House, two or fewer seats in the Senate. And what we found is that those election years were inherently much more volatile than typical years, uh, frankly, some with, with a downside bias. But in general, what it speaks to is the restlessness of the electorate uh, and this whole idea that the campaign, as we know, even though we're pricing it, is likely to, to remain contentious, but against the backdrop of geopolitics as well, promises to underpin volatility in a way which didn't happen in 2023. Okay, well, we're going to, I'm certainly, I'm, I'm transfixed, uh, quite literally. An Irish man transplanted to the UK, living in the Middle East with not an election under my belt <laughs> since Brexit. So I am fascinated uh, to see how things change and how the ballot gets decided. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a pretty punchy one. Uh, Julian, thank you very much. Good to meet Julian Emmanuel there uh, with the very latest on politics. Coming up in the show, markets move, events define the future in the trading diary. We'll give you what's on the slate right here on Bloomberg.
time for your trading diary. This is what you need to keep an eye on for the rest of the week. Obviously, payrolls tomorrow is the all-important one. Plus, the Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin speaks. Next week, it's all about inflation and the CPI. Super cool CPI to be exact. Jobless claims on Thursday and finally the PPI on Friday. It's day two sitting in for Jonathan. Don't worry, he will be back. Let me leave you a snapshot of Apple. Four days, 6% lower and $180 billion lighter on market cap.